Welcome to the Dragon's Library, your source for games, movies, shows, and more. Hello everybody, and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. So today we are talking about The Last Stand of Mary Good Crow by Rachel Aaron. Yay, a new book review, and yay, a new Rachel Aaron book! This actually kind of stuck up on me because I didn't realize Rachel Aaron was going to be starting a new series so soon. But yeah, we've got something fun. Historical fantasy out in the Old West with magical eldritch crystal abominations, a girl who can hear crystals talking, a, you know, daughter of a necromancer who's now a gunslinger with a magic gun, and a wealthy heiress trying to get her magic crystal mining business off the ground. Lots of fun to go with. So we got a lot to unpack here. Let's start off with a uh, basic introduction for those of you who haven't watched or listened to multiple other episodes of this show, <laughs> because I talk about Rachel Aaron a decent amount, I'd say. Uh, she's the writer of the Heartstriker series, as well as the spin-off DFZ series, and she's one of my favorite writers. Uh, ever since I found her Heartstriker's book series, I have been very interested in following her stuff, and when I found she had a spin-off series, I immediately picked it up. So now finding that she's started on some new book series, I'm like, uh, yes, please, more of her characters. One thing I've always really liked about Rachel Aaron, before we get started with the actual story, is that she's very good with character interactions, and a lot of her, like, protagonists have good chemistry together. The, her pairings and uh, tri- triples of t- protagonists are always very good. Like, you had Opal, the AI, and... Nicholas Koss in the DFZ series, you had Marcy, Ghost, and Julius, as well as the side characters like Amelia and Chelsea. She's just really good at writing characters. And even if their plots can get a little messy sometimes, like, I'm not sure the Heart Sugar plot it holds up entirely. On a moment-to-moment basis, it's enjoyable. And the overarching arc for the characters are always really good. And that's very much reflected in her, her latest work. So... Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's get started on the last stand of Mary Good Crow. And let's start with the principal protagonist and the main plot. So, this is a historical fantasy set in the Old West, specifically around the time of the Gold Rush. However, in this universe, in 1866, a crystal mine was discovered in Medicine Rocks, Montana. And this mine contained magic crystals, which have all sorts of unique properties depending on the color. A, a rich, well, basically a family member of a rich family who had kind of outcast himself to go be a part of, you know, the gold rush and make a name for himself. Essentially someone who was born to money but decided he didn't want his family's money and wanted to earn his way to that level of status. Uh, started off a main company that ended up founding the town of Medicine Rocks, Montana, with the only known magic crystal mine on Earth. Now this land is also... Uh, partially under the control of the Sequoia Federation, which are a Native American group in actual history who fought against the U.S. government's invasion of their lands. And you've got General Custer's army in the Battle of Little Bighorn that starts starts and ends over the course of this book. So it's set in a very distinct time period. But this time period has essentially had a few decades of what is essentially an industrial revolution slash gold rush centered around this one town. Basically, the U.S., as a result of the crystal mines, has gained access to very unique weapons and even mages. People can ingest or embed themselves with the crystal in order to uh, gain control of it, and some people can even manipulate the crystal out beyond what's normal. For example, the father of one of the main characters was a necromancer, because you can actually, if you gain enough connection to the crystals and control, learn to control them without having to ingest it constantly all the time. But there are horrible side effects, and if you don't, if you aren't very, very careful, it's very easy to be mutated into a horrible monster. Uh, in addition, there seems to be some kind of eldritch force behind this power, which is not great for the individuals who consume it. You know, driven mad and all stuff like that. Not to mention the mines are essentially a Lovecraftian dungeon, where the start with, it's an area where you can't even see or anything like that, and you go mad. Ghosts are everywhere. It's just a very interesting, distinct world. Now, the story follows Mary Goodcrow, who is a half-white, half Lakotan um, girl. She was raised by nuns. She went to go try and be the Lakotan tribe, but they didn't want her. So she eventually made a life for herself as a guide in the tunnels. 
because she has an ability that the founder of the com- mining company also had, which is that she can essentially hear the song of the crystals. Uh, the crystals make a unique song whenever you tap them, and you have to do it just right in order to mine them. But she can hear it even when they're not being hit, which allows her to essentially find veins and have a sort of mystical connection to the crystals. Now, there have been other characters that have, but they're so rare, the people who get, have this ability oftentimes think they're the only ones who have it. For example, the only other person we currently know of is Sam Price, who founded the mines. But both him and Mary are the only people we know of in the entire town. Remember, this is like a gold rush town, like if, as if all the gold rush is in one place. And even like people in general, it's very rare for anybody to be able to hear the song on their own. Um, and so she is, you know, being a guide, but she's not trusted because the Sequoia is still fighting the U.S. government. So there's a lot of mistrust there. She's harassed a lot in town, and but she's getting by as a guide. Anyway, Sam Price died a little while back, and his business got shut down, but his niece, supposedly, came into town. Her name is Josie Price, and she's ready to start the family business again. But in order to do so, she needs to reclaim her uncle's uh, last big score, because it's rumored he came across some big, giant crystal cache before he died, but nobody could find the claim information, and so everybody's looking for it. In addition, a bounty hunter working for one of the saloons looking for her father's killer uh, and carrying her father's soul. Well, she's not really looking for her father's killer. She's more looking for her mother and son's killer because she hates her dad. But her dad's soul is kind of bound to a magic gun she uses. So what are you going to do about it? Yeah, I love I love these characters. They're so much fun. So Mary, Josie, and Rel have to venture into the mines with Mary guiding them to find this giant cache of crystals, potentially uncovering the true nature of the crystals, and saving Josie's business. Rel can get enough money so she, so she can uh, finance her revenge campaign against her family's murderer, and finally put her mother and brother's souls to rest. And meanwhile, Mary just kind of wants... To keep living her life and not be harassed. And this is a pretty good job for her. But she ends up making friends along the way. So that's nice. I won't go into anything more than that. There's more spoiler stuff I could have done. There's a lot of secondary details. And there's some plot twists that happened early on that I'm not spoiling involving Josie. You'll know what I mean. And yes, I know the truth about her. I just didn't want to spoil that because I think it's a cool twist. I think the introduction for her is really, really nice. So I'm not going to do that. Even yes, even though yes, you do learn the truth in like... The first, like, five or six chapters. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, I loved this book. It's going to be really hard giving myself a book of the year. I think I still think When Win More Dragons will probably be my book of the year. But Rachel Aaron's The Last Name of Mary Crow is an excellent example of historical fantasy. Reminds me a lot of the Temeraire series by Naomi Novik. Also a series with good characters. And Naomi Novik herself is having another book, the last book of one of her new series, the Golden Enclave is coming out. And between these two and uh, When Women Were Dragons and The Book of Night, I've just been bombarded by excellent fantasy series this year. And I really do have to say, in any other year, I feel like The Last Man of Mary Crow would probably be my book of the year. Unfortunately, we have a lot of good fantasy stuff coming out this year, and that's going to put up against some stiff competition. I do think it loses to When Women Were Dragons. I think it beats out Book of Night. Uh, the story is very quick paced. It's to the point. It's not as long, but it's not really trying to be as much of a mystery as Book of Night was. It's more of a exploration, treasure hunting kind of story where the characters are trying to uncover a mystery, but it's more of the journey and the interesting traps and things they had to avoid along the way. Definitely has good themes about the corrupting power of greed and prejudice. Uh, that I'm guessing the prejudice one is going to be built upon more in later series because the ending kind of put Mary in a position where she's going to have to learn more about the Lakota uh, and her connection to this force inside the crystals. Not going to say more than that. But all in all, this was an excellent read with good characters, a cool setting, interesting plot hook, a great magic system, and quite frankly... It's the kind of first book that makes me feel like, oh yes, I would totally want to see more of this. I definitely want to figure out where all these characters go. But it also had its own complete story. And the characters ended up separated near the end, like all three of them. So I'm really interested to see 
what's going to happen, how are we getting these disconnected plot lines back together, especially Rel. Reliance, I am desperate to know what's going to happen with her because she has such a cool backstory. Like, she has, like, she's like a gunslinger with magic guns and she can ingest crystalline liquor in order to see and talk to ghosts. Like, that is just such a cool idea for a character. I mean, come on. Hmm. So yeah, Rachel Aaron has once again hooked me on a series. Big surprise. I really hope she releases another book next year, because I think without the rest of the competition, that book is definitely going to take book of the year. So looking forward to that, Rachel Aaron. I can't give it to you this year, but I will be hoping you release in a less packed year. <laughs> so yeah, I would definitely recommend this to you. Easy 9 out of 10 for me. All right. That's about it. So, moving on from there, we are going to the spoiler section. If you have not read this, go read this book, because there are some really interesting fun twists in here. There's some lots of little fun details on the side. And quite frankly, I just think this is wonderful. So, let's get started, everybody. Okay, moving on to the first major twist that I hinted at. So, when J Josie Price comes to town... She has all these papers to confirm that she's been, you know, because she's been writing to her uncle, who's kind of like the disgrace member of her family, because he decided to go out and earn his wealth. And apparently that makes the rest of the family feel insulted. Uh, and apparently he became really, really rich. And Josie was required to write a letter to him. However, Josie Price didn't write a letter to him. She got her servant, who was named Josie, was about the same age as her. Her mother worked for the family, so she's kind of, you know, working for the family, too. And Josie Whitman, I believe? No, wait, the Whitmans are the bandits. It was Josie O'Connor. She had wrote a letter to her uncle under the name Jos Josie Price. Because Josie could not be bothered to. Apparently, she's actually more of a rich, spoiled kid. And uh, apparently, her uncle is really surprised that he might wrote to her. So he wrote back, very enthusiastic. And Josie was so enthused by his response that she just kept writing. And since she started out this communication as Josie Price, they just kind of kept it up. Which is why that Josie Price, despite being a spoiled brat who her uncle probably wouldn't have left anything to, ended up being the person that, uh, you know, Sam Price left everything to. Which I find is just a really interesting situation to be in. And she ended up telling Josie this, and Josie sent her down here to get all the affairs in order under the pretext that she would remain in St. Louis. Now, as long as Josie O'Connor can continuously send her money... To maintain her lifestyle, she is free, in turn, to run the business down there. Because she had basically helped uh, Sam Price design all. Now, I'm not really sure how much Josephine Price knows about this, and I'll call her Josephine Price in the future to distinguish the two. But it's implied she either knows enough or just doesn't really care. As long as the money is coming, she doesn't care. So, Josephine is a... Josie... The, Josie, the main character, or one of the three main characters, is essentially in a position where she can live out her dreams and coming out to the Old West and running the, and helping to recover the business that this distant relative of her mistress, who she felt more connection to than any member of his family, to the point where, like, even his, like, most loyal assistant knows Josie and is like, I've been waiting to meet you all these years, I can't believe it. However, when Rel comes in, he's like, uh, I used to work for your dad. Your family member. I used to work with you on their estate back in the east. Yeah, remember? And she's like, oh, no, 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 can't tell them, you can't tell them. So Reliance actually knows about Josie. As like, uh, Josephine Price came here to run a business. And it's just like, oh, no, that's Josie O'Connor. It's like, wait, what are you talking about? He's the, he, it's an old name. Uh, one moment, please. <laughs> It's just this moment of, uh, like, okay, Josie, I get what you're doing this, but you really just need to sell it to me. Because uh, the people he works for, want, or the people she works for, want the business in order to take over the massive claim he was apparently found. Meanwhile, you have Mary, who's constantly get, trying to get ripped off, and the cavalry around there just don't treat her that well. Because, you know, the government is at war with people she looks a lot like, so yes, there is racism. This is, all right, look, this is the 1860s. If you are surprised that there is racism in rural, in like, you know, t a territory of America in the 1860s, I'm sorry, I don't know where you expect it to be. This is, uh, 
But the, to be fair, the story doesn't really focus on it as much. Like, it is a background element and definitely an overarching theme, but it's not the main theme. The largest theme is probably the corrupting power of greed and the way it forces us to do things that we probably know we shouldn't be doing, even to the point of tearing ourselves apart. And I actually really do like how the main group seem above the greed. They genuinely don't want to tear themselves apart. In fact, Josie proves herself to be a very remarkable and smart protagonist. See, Josie's the one who technically owns the claim because she is acting as Joyce, Josie Price, Josephine Price, under her uh, orders. So that means she does have a certain amount of authority, even if the legality is a little weird, to act in her nature. And so long as she can get the money to Josie, Josephine, then it's fine. She can keep doing this. She can keep living this life. And she can even build a life for herself of more than something more than just a servant girl. Which is really what she wants. She wants to build a new life for herself. And this is probably the only chance she will ever get. So she's desperate to get to this claim, to find the secret claim. And all she has is a secret crystal that glows that her fa- her uncle or Sam Price hid for her. So Josie O'Connor has to figure out how to do this. Now she talks to Rel, and he's she's like, okay, look, there is rumors of a guide who may or may not be able to hear crystals like your old like your old man was supposed to do and i'll just call her old man because honestly sam price was essentially an uncle to josie like he was more an uncle to josephine connor than she was to josephine price that's just a fact like josie price didn't give a shit about him josephine connor did josie connor did i keep mixing the two up i'm sorry but I really like this. I really like this dynamic they have. And she's like, all right, look, there's this girl, Mary, Mary Goodcrow. And actually, I kind of like the explanation they give for her name because it sounds like one of those names that's kind of racist. And it's like, eh, no, it's like, that's, I wasn't named for anything like my tribe did. It's like, the nuns who took me in named me Mary because the Virgin Mary. They named me Good as my middle name because they wanted me to be good. And they named me Crow because my hair was really black and they saw a crow when I was first dropped off. So that's my last name. Uh, and they also thought it sounded vaguely Native American-ish. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was like, yeah, no, no, no. People say that all the time. It's fine. I don't even really know the Lakota that much. They kind of kicked me out the second I got over there. So, whatever. Uh, there's that brief moment of like, oh, okay. And it actually makes sense, because she was raised by nuns. Of course, they probably name her like Mary. That's a pretty common name for a religious family, you know? Uh, Virgin Mary and all that. So I'm fine with that. I think that's I think that works out well. Um, all in all, yeah. But anyway, so the three of them have to go into the tunnels. They first run into the dark, which is essentially this uh, section that's full of basically this giant wall of darkness that moves around a lot. It also muffles sound and essentially dampens all your senses, so you can get lost in the tunnels. In addition to the fact that there are cracks that will just open up, like, the whole tunnels come across as, like, like gigantic Lovecraftian entity that's almost alive. You know, cracks will open up and then close, trying to catch people like bear traps. There's an angry bear woman in there who will just, like, murder you if you, you use any explosives. Uh, there's a section called the Deep where the world will just change the moment you blink. So they enter in the Deep in this, like, grassland area, and then while uh, Mary's on watch... She, like, blinks, and suddenly they're in normal tunnels. It's like, what the hell? I think we moved. We didn't move. It's like the tunnels shifted. We didn't. And it gives you this sense of, yeah, people probably died out here a lot. It's like, oh, yeah, people die here a lot. The dark alone has so many ghosts that if you can see ghosts like Mary or like Rel when he, when she's using the uh, magic liquor, then, yeah, it's literally just packed to the wall with ghosts of all the dead people. And it's just like, holy shit. But you also get the sense that this magic is actually really, really valuable. These crystals can do crazy stuff, like full-on body augmentation, super strength, guns that can literally destroy your soul, full-on necromancy. Like, you can do some crazy shit with this stuff. Uh, some of the Native American tribes even use it in the Battle of Little Bighorn. We hear about like them using this fog that can like suffocate you like it's a physical creature. Or 
uh, these this memory magic that wiped the minds of everyone around them and gave them this irresistible urge to return to the land of their birth. So only the people who are born in this area will stay, and all the others will just keep walking until the other die or get back home. Uh, and it's just like this horrible, like dark magic almost. Like all of its power comes across as very twisted. Even like the more controlled uses uh, come across as dangerous and corruptive almost. Which I personally find really interesting. I like a magic system that feels like a force of nature. Like something dangerous. That if you wrangle it too much, it might just bite you. <laughs> and that's very much how this comes across. It's really cool. I, I can't really say more than that. Turns out Rachel Aaron does really good magic systems. I, I know. She does good characters and good magic systems, Davis. Uh, sorry. I, I am very much a Rachel Aaron fanboy, so... <laughs> I should probably get that out there. I should probably gotten that out there earlier, but most people could tell. Mm. Also, they do a very good job portraying General Custer as kind of a dick. <laughs> like, he's an asshole. Uh, so, that's all I'm going to say on that. Trust me, if you read it and you don't think he's an asshole, I don't know what to tell you. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, after they find the claim, Josie declares to the world that she's one of the most intelligent people in the plot. See... The main problem Josie has had is that she's very clearly about to find one of the largest claims her fa- her uncle ever found. But this is a town where people are quite willing le- willing to kill you or punch you off a cliff and take their your deed for themselves so they can get all the crystal for you. Because this stuff is now more valuable than gold by the pound. So when they find it, and it's just Rel, Mary, and Josie, she has a problem. And she had a problem before when they were just getting close. Once they reached the deep and it was, and she was certain that Mary could talk to the crystals or at least hear it and lead them there, she had a problem because she knew, she knew this meant they were going to find it. And if they found it, they were going to find essentially infinite wealth or at least the potential for infinite wealth if it was mined. And that's something that Rel needs and that Mary could probably use. And then let's move away. Even if they didn't want to try and mine it for themselves, just selling the information to someone would be more valuable than they could probably hope to mine on their own anyway. Like, there will be definitely a few people in town willing to pay absurd amounts of money for this. Rally's even almost offered her father's killer's name, so really her mother and brother's killer's name, in order to give them the information, or at least get the deed from Josie. So when they first get there, Josie decides to do something smart. She decides to make sure they are the only people who know about it, or at least where it is, and that they all have an equal claim to it. She divides the cavern in three, uh, in even giving Mary this large pillar that speaks to her very kindly, uh, because it's like the most beautiful thing Mary's ever seen. And she's not even going to mine it. She's going to keep it perfectly preserved like that. Cause she loves the sound it makes. Uh, cause it sings this really beautiful song that almost gives her like a sense of euphoria. And, you know, she gives her that. She's like, yeah, yeah, that, that's your section. And Rel can have that section. She can take all the money she needs in order to find her father's killer, find her family's killer, get revenge. And I will take this section, use it to rebuild my uncle's life's work. And it's this very smart moment of she realizes this is so valuable that anyone who's not in on it will likely sell them out. So she makes sure they're all equally in on it, which is very smart of her. I have to give her credit there. It is a very intelligent thing to do, especially since Mary is the only one who can find this place because you need to be able to hear the crystal in order to get there. Plus, the crystal she used as a finder exploded in Mary's palm, which means she's the only one who has the shards embedded in her now. Plus, Mary can find this place even without those shards because she's been here, she's heard the song, and now she can hear it basically wherever she goes. Basically, Mary's the compass. Rel is the muscle that let them get here on, without dying. And Josie's the legal owner, plus has the resources and home they'll need in order to conduct their business. They essentially became equal partners, and Josie realizes this, realizes it is the best attempt to prevent them from splintering themselves through greed, and decides to act as such. Which is probably one of the smartest things I've ever seen a character do to prevent their team from 
ripping itself apart over the corrupted power of greed. It's not let the corrupted power of greed just then lose this place forever. It's we will divide equally and all get a share. That way, anyone who backstabs us backstabs themselves. Good plan. I like it. And it even works. Rel is very tempted to just take this money and use it to hunt down her killer rather than working for this shady saloon slash brothel slash rival mining place that's been trying to get her to steal the deed from Josie. And yeah, it almost works. In fact, I would say it did technically work because Rel ends up regretting her choices and starting not to do it. And they go down as they go down there with some of the military men because they've offered the military a chunk of their crystals in order to fight their war in order to also deal with the bandit Whitmans who accosted them earlier on. They're basically these uh, necro. They stole the necromancer papers from Rel's father and have essentially become necromatic zombie slave bandits. It's weird. Like they have this one guy who's basically an undead dog guy. Uh, and this other guy is like a giant pumpkin man. It's weird. But yeah, so one of the Whitman, the two Whitman brothers stole Rel's father's papers, and so they've been practicing early necromancy. And Rel's father, from the gun, is constantly trying to tempt her to do things and start training her power so she can properly uh, sustain her abilities in order to avenge them. And the final act as... Oh, God, so how do you even explain this? So the voice that Mary had been hearing was actually an ancient Lovecraftian god called The Song of the End of All Things, or The Cataclysm. And the bear woman used to be one of its avatars, and now Mary has, by singing the song, become an avatar with it. And she did that in order to gain the power to stop the Whitmans from killing them all. But while she was doing that, Rel became essentially... uh, (laughs) See, Rel started using her father's powers, but she made a deal with her father in order to use his full might... And he sort of body swapped her. So now he's in her body and he, she's in the gun. And he's remarkably more dangerous than her. And it's kind of funny too, because it's the whole thing of like tempting dark powers thing. But ironically, if she had actually listened to her father and done what he asked, like learned to use the ability, she said, I would have probably liked to keep this body if you had had even a, you had a lot of talent for necromancy, but you didn't even want to listen to my ability. So now you need me. And now, when you need me, I'm going to take over. So it's implied that if she had listened and learned slowly over time, he wouldn't have been able to overpower her. But because she was had gone to a situation where she was untrained and needed the full powers that he had access to, he had a free chance to take her body. And he's kind of a dick, so he decided to take the chance when he was offered to him. So it's one of those weird inversions where if she had just learned to use the curse power in small amounts, she wouldn't have been overwhelmed when she had to use it all at once. And she probably wouldn't have been corrupted by it. So... I mean, bad decisions, bad decisions. Anyway, Rel start, Rel, now possessed by her father, starts going full necromancer madman and decides I'm going to kill you all and study the Lovecraftian god for myself. Uh, Mary t- takes its power and uses it to send Rel falling down the canyon. She doesn't die though, so she's still alive, possessed by her father and stuck in a gu- magic gun. Uh, Mary ends up falling beneath the caves after opening up a a tunnel for one of the officers who's not that much of a dick and that she saved earlier on in the book along with Josie to be, who was injured to be carried off to safety, but she gets separated. She tells them to go on without her and she gets lost deep beneath the caves, eventually being found by a girl who reveals that she's her sister. Fun. Josie, meanwhile, makes up. They've got a decent crystal hall, but unfortunately they lost a lot of men and they also lost both Rel and Mary and only Rel and only Mary and Josie, Mary, due to being able to see the ghost possessing her, and Josie for believing Mary, realized that Rel wasn't acting as a monster. She was being possessed by her evil father. So, the you know, the government is now probably after Rel as a full-on monster, which is not great. Uh, Josie is left, yes, with the money to do what she needs to with the company, but both her friends gone. And Mary has just been found by her half-sister or whatever, maybe her full sister, I don't know. Who she is apparently just did not know about, which I just find weird. So yeah, that's how this book ended. And it's one of those things where it's like, I really liked the overarching plot and they didn't work with all the things they have. But it's also like, I really, really want to know how this ends up because this was a lot of fun. Also, Custer's army got destroyed, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, it turns out because they were trying to ignore that the, apparently the Sequoia 
ended up having another interest into the mines and they've been mining the crystal with more refined techniques. And they're like, oh, those savages don't know how to use it. It's like, yeah, no, they know how to use this magic way better than you guys do. Their shamans are like full on mages and their like arrowheads are freaking explosive tank busters. What the hell are you doing against that kind of audience? You're going to fire your 1800s guns at it? Yeah, that's not going to work. A little six shooter against an arrow that can pierce a tank. I know which one I'm betting on. Ugh. Sorry, but it's just like, it's so hilarious. Because there's this lieutenant that comes up earlier from this mission. Uh, Mary found him in the dark, really injured. And apparently he had gone on a scouting expedition to find the rumored Sukhoi deep in the caves. And he found them tending and working it in all these intricate shapes. And the mages doing all these creepy things with it. And he goes to tell his general, it's like, dude, they have all these crazy powers. They can use this stuff in ways we never even thought to. We are not actually the technologically superior foe right now, and they have numbers on our side. We should not go out to fight this foe. And General Custer's just like, nah, I'll go do it. I'll show these savages what for. And it's just like, dude, you're going to get murdered. <laughs> He's like, oh, don't talk back to me, Lieutenant. I know what I'm doing. And then he just goes out and dies. And it's just like, yeah, that guy deserved it. <laughs> I'm sorry, he did. Oh, so yeah, this this has been a fun book. I know I went a little crazy here, but I got really taken up in this story. There's all these little details that I'm just like, okay, so we got the, you know, girl with the murdered family, and she's really got her asshole father trapped from the gun. Now she's a necromancer possessed by her father. We got Mary's whole side story with the Lakota. We've got Josie and the mystery of her uncle and what he was doing in this these mines and what can these new variations of the crystal she took out do. And all in all, I'm just really looking forward to the next book in this series. And yes, it has a big old number one on the spine. So this is very much the first in one of Rachel Aaron's new series. And to be honest, I just cannot wait for the next book. All right, that's basically it for today. Moving on to upcoming news. If you're watching this on Sprout, then tomorrow I will be starting on my new stream. Or actually, the same day this comes out, I'll be starting on the stream. Huh. <laughs> Recording nights. And I will be reviewing The Quarry, that new... It's essentially Until Dawn, but in a quarry from what I've heard. So, it's going to be fun. In addition to that, I will be reviewing Umbrella Academy Season 3, which was also really good this week, later on, on Thursday. And next week, I'm not sure what I'm doing for Tuesday yet, but on Thursday next week, I will be reviewing Thor, Love and Thunder. Love and Thunder... Oh, uh, that movie looks so good, and I cannot wait for Thor 4. OMG. We're finally getting the fate. Jane Foster Thor line. Yes. Mm -mm. It's going to be fun. So, yeah. See you guys next time. Bye. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode, and thank you for listening to The Dragon's Library. Please, subscribe to this podcast to be notified of new episodes. The Dragon's Library releases new episodes Tuesday and Friday each week, and you can follow us on Twitter at dragon underscore library 2. If you want to suggest an episode topic, my email is in the description below. And as always, thank you so much for all your support.